evening to you all and welcome to tonight's program sponsored by the Metro West Climate Solutions Group. I'm Jeff Barstell. I'm a member of the steering committee, the all volunteer steering committee, and I am also minister of the First Parish Church in Weston. We're delighted to have you all here this evening. Metro West Climate Solutions, or MCS as we call it, is a partnership of congregations and organizations in the Metro West area. This includes First Parish in Wayland, First Parish Church in Weston, First Parish in Lincoln, the Congregational Church in Weston, the Sustainable Weston Action Group, otherwise known as SWAG, and a growing list, and it is a growing list, of organizations and individuals. Our mission is to foster sustainable, resilient, and equitable communities and, and host timely and relevant programs uh, that encourage people and organizations to get involved in bringing about solutions to some of the great challenges of our time. For more information about our work or to view recordings of some of our past programs, which have been excellent, go to MetroWestClimateSolutions.org. Given the events of the last few weeks, the global issues involving various countries' production of and dependence on fossil fuels has come into stark relief. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, what the world will look like, would look like, if we did not have to rely on fossil fuels coming out of autocratic regimes. Given the urgent necessity of reducing carbon emissions, this scenario is hopefully a part of our collective future. There can be no doubt, however, that the pathway to any low carbon future is paved by ambitious and thoughtful legislation, such as the bills we will discuss this evening. Tonight's program is part one of a two-part program that seeks to provide an overview and update on climate legislation here in the Commonwealth. Tonight, we feature the Senate side of the debate and consideration. Our very capable moderator for tonight is the well-known and very well-respected advocate and policy expert, Cindy Lupe, who is the New England Director for Clean Water Action. I have personally known Cindy for, oh my goodness, I think it's coming on 20 years, and appreciate her intelligence, her breadth of knowledge, and her ability to work with many different constituencies and groups. Cindy has worked with Clean Water Action for over 25 years, helping to coordinate a number of coalitions and community-based efforts to reduce pollution and promote a cleaner and more sustainable economy. Among other climate initiatives, she coordinated the Northeast Clean Power Campaign, which successfully pressed for cleanup of the region's biggest industrial polluters. This included the oldest and most polluting coal and oil-fired power plants in New England, including the one in Salem where I used to live. In fact, based on Cindy's work and a few other inspiring people like her, I got involved with the coalition that ultimately helped to close down one of the largest coal-fired power plants in Massachusetts. Cindy currently represents Clean Water Action on the Green Justice Coalition, which is dedicated to stimulating green jobs creation in growth sectors such as energy efficiency and providing pathways out of poverty and low-income communities in Massachusetts. We are delighted to have her here with us to introduce our speakers, uh, Senator Barrett and Professor uh, Knittel. I will now turn it over to Cindy. Welcome to tonight's program and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, Jeff, um, I think conveniently uh, left out his important role in the effort to clean up uh, the, the Salem plant and, and many other important climate justice campaigns. So. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with him and with all of you. Um, Clean Water Action, uh, for those of you who don't know and may be wondering what is a water group doing talking about clean energy and climate, um, has been a, a long time player in efforts to transition our region away from polluting energy sources to uh, carbon free and um, air pollutant free alternatives. And, uh, I have a, a few board members who say that it's all related to water, but um, I, I think that the clearest picture here for me is the frame that climate change is water change. So um, all of us who love water have, have a, a clear stake in tonight's discussion and thrilled to be here. Uh, clean water is part of a number of coalitions. We definitely believe in building political power through linking arms with 
with uh, groups like yours and uh, many across the region and, and pressing with smart strategy towards, uh, towards goals that will lead us to a healthier and uh, more vibrant tomorrow. So uh, with that, that's me. Uh, I'm our regional director and um, I am thrilled to introduce our speakers this evening. We're really fortunate to have uh, two uh, amazing uh, uh, presenters here with us. The first who's going to speak is Professor Christopher Knittel, um, who is the George P. Schultz Professor and a Professor of Applied Economics at the MIT Sloan School of Environmental Economics and Applied Econometrics. That's a long sentence, <laughs> Professor Knittel. <laughs> um, uh, um, Professor Knittel is an associate editor of the American Economic Journal and a number of other um, prestigious environmental journals. And he is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in the Productivity, Industrial Organization, and Energy and Environmental Economics groups. Uh, so we're, we're thrilled to have uh, to have you here. Um, also, I'm going to introduce Senator Mike Barrett, who I think many of you know because he is many of your senators. Um, many of your, yes, senators. <laughs> uh, Senator Barrett represents the third Middlesex district, uh, which includes a big swath of uh, Metro West, including Bedford, Carlisle, Concord, Lincoln, Waltham, Weston, and uh, large parts of Lexington and Sudbury. He serves as the chair uh, for the Senate's uh, Legislative Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities and Energy. And this is a key committee for all the issues we're gonna talk about tonight because the jurisdiction of the committee covers everything from cell phones to alternative energy, to public utility reform, to carbon pricing. Uh, so with that, thank you both for, for being here. And thank you all for being here. I know we have, so many Zooms in our daily lives. Um, your presence here uh, as, as part of this discussion is deeply appreciated. So with that, uh, let's uh, turn things over to Professor Knittel and um, have him launch tonight's discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I guess the first step is to make sure you can hear me. Is that, I was having microphone problems. I actually switched to my uh, teaching little teaching studio that I, set up at home uh, for COVID reasons. Um, so I thought about different things I could do and present tonight. Um, I threw together some slides uh, that I'll talk about just the basics of, of climate policy and how economists think about climate policy. Um, if we won, I also threw together some slides on, you know, what the unrest in Europe might do to climate change and climate change policy, but I'll hold off on presenting those uh, until we um, the Q&A period. So let me share my screen. Um, so I wear a few hats at MIT. Um, my main hat is, I'm, as was noted, I'm a professor of applied economics. Uh, I'm also the director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research and that's the hub for social science and policy work around climate, energy, and, and the environment more generally. And finally, the third hat I wear is I'm, I'm the policy or deputy director for policy of the MIT Energy Initiative, which is the hub for energy work more generally. And, and there we, we combine the social scientists that exist in CEPR with the hard scientists that exist around campus to try to think about what a carbon-free economy might look like. Um, but what I wanted to talk tonight about is, is, is policy. And I think the first thing to start with, at least the way economists view the world, um, is that markets typically work really well. Uh, we, there's thousands, of, if not millions of markets that we interact with every day that we never worry about. Um, but there are times when we do worry about the outcome of a market and climate change is, is one of those times. And effectively what climate change means is that when you and I and, and firms go to make decisions about products that generate greenhouse gas emissions, we're not incorporating all the costs 
all the societal costs in, in our decisions. And what that means is we overproduce and we overconsume those, those products. And economists call those externalities. Um, my decision to, to pump a gallon of gasoline in my car not only impacts me because I have to pay the $3.50 for that gallon of gasoline, but it affects you and future generations as well. And I'm not incorporating that into my decision to buy that gallon of gasoline. So I buy too many gallons of gasoline. I buy a vehicle that's not fuel efficient enough. And there's all sorts of different decisions that are affected by that. What's frustrating from an economist perspective is we've actually known how to fix the problem for about a hundred years. Uh, so Arthur Pigou in, uh, in 1920 uh, wrote a famous paper that showed us the best way to fix the market when in the presence of these externalities is to put a price on the externality itself. Uh, and that could be done through a carbon tax or a, or a cap and trade system where you've effectively reversed the existence of the externality. And you know, we can talk about the strengths and weaknesses of cap and trade versus a carbon tax, uh, but you know, effectively both of those are able to fix the market. Now, politically or historically, we've relied on lots of alternatives uh, to a price on carbon or a price on pollution more generally. Um, and there's many alternatives. Um, Instead of taxing the bad, we could subsidize the good, either through EV subsidies or solar subsidies. You also look around policy and you see things that require a certain amount of the alternative uh, to, to the fossil fuel uh, dependent alternatives. Those are things like renewable portfolio standards or clean energy standards. We also uh, rely heavily on policies that um, require that the average externality is smaller than it otherwise would have been. That's like fuel economy standards or California has what's called a low carbon fuel standard. And then of course we could just ban the technology, whether it's a ban on incandescent light bulbs or, or California's ban on coal. This is frustrating from an economist perspective because there's lots of research and I've added to this research that shows that uh, these are much more expensive than pricing the externality directly, often as much as 10 times more expensive. They have their benefits, uh, and we can get into those in, a, in the Q&A as well. Uh, but by and large, they're expensive, and they lead to unintended consequences often that undo some of the uh, benefits that they, they might generate. I, we have even more recent work, a paper of mine that came out last uh, two years now, uh, that doesn't look at the extreme. So that literature that shows that uh, these alternatives are 10 times more expensive than a price on carbon, just as an all or nothing, you either price carbon or you do this alternative. In this paper, what we look at is, well, what if you do a little bit of both or maybe a lot of the alternatives, maybe for political reasons or other uh, strengths of, of those alternatives, but just a little bit of a carbon tax. Uh, what does that get us? And we actually find that you can get the majority of the cost savings of that price on carbon with a modest carbon price. So even if you want to rely more heavily on these alternatives, you still don't want to give up on having a price on carbon. Effectively, what a price on carbon is really good at is squeezing the last 10% or 20% or so um, from, of, of carbon or greenhouse gas emissions out of, out of the atmosphere. Another recent paper and another advantage of a price on carbon is uh, that it generates revenue internal to the policy itself. So you don't need to pass an, another tax policy in addition to say a solar subsidy or an EV subsidy. And that has a key advantage because uh, like it or not, low income households consume more of their income on energy than wealthy households. It's true that wealthy households have higher carbon footprints, but as a share of their income, it's, it's smaller. So the beauty of a, of a carbon tax that collects all the money and then sends it back in, in the form of a dividend check that's equal across all people or all households, because low-income households have smaller carbon footprints, they actually make money um, off of the deal. About 80% of low-income households would actually 
get a larger check than they would pay in uh, carbon tax revenue. Uh, so what we do in this recent paper is look across the entire US at how different carbon tax and dividend schemes and different pol policies more generally impact uh, different households across geography, across race, across ethnicity, across income, and, and so on. And that starts with generating actually a map of what carbon footprints look like. And that was not a trivial task. That's why the paper was so, so difficult. Um, effectively, we use machine learning techniques to forecast what carbon footprints look across the US. And I know we wanna focus on Massachusetts today, uh, but the map of the US is quite striking. So these are carbon footprints across the entire US. And there's a few th things that jump out at you, um, hopefully. Um, one is that you see that they tend to be much higher in the middle of the US. Um, they tend to be really low on the West Coast. They're high in the Northeast because of our reliance on heating oil and our climate more generally. Uh, so that's fact one. Uh, a second fact that you might be able to tease out of, out of the picture is that they tend to be really low in cities and higher in suburban and uh, rural areas. Um, and these are important for political reasons. Um, so a one size fits all tax and dividend plan might not work politically because what that's gonna do is send money from middle America to the coasts uh, because their footprints are higher in middle America and send money from rural America into the cities. So what we do in that paper is we look at alternative ways to, to uh, write those checks, so to speak. And uh, you, the nice thing is, like I said, you can easily undo uh, those negative impacts. So what do we learn? A price on carbon is much more efficient than the alternatives. But even if you don't want to give up completely on the alternatives, a modest price on carbon can get you lots of the uh, efficiency benefits uh, than, a, than a pure price on carbon would be, would do. And the price on carbon, because it generates money, can actually undo the potential negative impacts of uh, decarbonizing the economy on low-income households and uh, certain sectors of the economy more generally. Um, so at the end, I always, uh, of these sorts of talks, I always like to basically encourage people to follow my license plate, and that's my license plate. So why not have a tax on CO2? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to, uh, can you hear me, Chris? Okay. Yes. Uh, that was terrific. And um, you're prompting me to change the uh, opening glide path of my own comments because I want to uh, connect up with your uh, clarion call for carbon pricing. Uh, in part, uh, in good part, uh, relying on your advice and the rely and the advice of some uh, friends of ours whom we all know, uh, Jim Stock of Lincoln and uh, Gib Metcalf of Concord. Uh, the three of you have uh, helped me think about carbon pricing. And I started out my Senate career in 2013 proposing a revenue neutral price on carbon, which means that we'd collect a lot of money by taxing carbon across the economy and distribute all of it uh, back. Uh, and uh, because of the numbers that you pointed me to among others, uh, we know that people of more means would pay a higher tax because they consume more electricity so that if we sent it back per capita, 60% of Massachusetts would get back more money than they originally paid as a carbon fee or tax. And 40%, the wealthiest 40%, would wind up paying more in fee than um, they got back. And in effect, it would be a progressive system. That's a pure carbon tax that's revenue neutral. And politics has uh, arisen the way politics will. And I could, uh, I struggled tremendously to uh, put together a coalition, majority of votes in both the Massachusetts House and the Massachusetts Senate. And again, I know this is old news to many people on this call. And, and incidentally, I want to thank Metro West uh, very much. I want to thank Jeff and I want to thank Cindy and everyone, Stephanie, everyone involved in putting together 
this meeting this evening. Why do politics interfere? Uh, and then I'm, I'm gonna quickly make an observation and then go to several slides that I've got. Um, I, I, I perceive several reasons. First of all, to get a good grassroots movement going, you uh, try to build coalitions. There's nothing wrong with that in principle. I spend uh, all my time worrying about coalitions within the legislature uh, myself. Uh, but as soon as you get into coalition building, you start to encounter groups with whom you feel a kinship who have somewhat different needs. In Massachusetts, uh, it's typical for um, groups interested in jobs to uh, be part of that coalition. I, I, I mentioned uh, uh, very honorably organized labor. Organized labor inevitably because of its membership needs is in fact a little more interested in jobs than it is in climate policy. So uh, before you know it, uh, the jobs piece is driving the climate piece and in a slightly different direction that climate policy would be driven by itself. So the politics of coalitions immediately throws off the, the pure rationality of carbon tax thinking. Uh, you're now in the real world with real human beings with competing priorities and competing needs. The other uh, real time reality I immediately encountered was the people didn't want to send the money back. They, uh, the coalition building imperative also meant that you were working with groups who uh, wanted the money to spend on good things. And so you started to adulterate the pure redistributional impact of a, a tax and dividend plan. And you started to use the carbon tax as primarily a tax rather than as climate policy. Uh, so very soon uh, between the groups that, that wanna hold on to the money, uh, at which point, by the way, the redistributive impact declines and you're starting to hurt the working class and middle class people you'd like because you're, well, you're taxing them and it's a regressive tax. Between that and the uh, switch of emphasis to job creation from emissions reduction, very soon you're in a swamp or at least you're in trouble. Uh, but the third thing that happens, of course, is that as soon as your coalition develops an appetite for a tax for good reasons, you start to lose votes in the legislature, uh, which in the best of times is phobic about tax increases. And now, of course, we don't find ourselves in the best of times. We find ourselves in a high inflation environment where beginning with the uh, yellow vest movement in France uh, and then continuing up right into the present day, people have become very angry at increases in the costs of basic necessities, whether it's gasoline or electricity. So a carbon tax, which would have folks pay more upfront in order to benefit future generations later, runs into the reality that people, well, <laughs> do not want to pay more today. And they talk to their legislators and suddenly I can't get votes, especially in, in the somewhat more conservative house, but, but even in the Senate, we scramble. I, I notice I'm on this call with a, a friend of mine and my former uh, legal counsel, Sam Anderson, who's now with Audubon. And Sam could attest to how tough it was to round up votes for the rational thing. So uh, we've defaulted to those, uh, those alternatives, Chris, that you mentioned in one of your slides. Um, but let me pick up a, a, another theme here that, that I wanna share with the audience because it, it relates to the international picture. I went to Glasgow to the most recent COP, the international gathering on climate. And uh, I just wanna share two or three slides to give you, to, to offer a contrast to what we are trying to do in Massachusetts. And, and in the Climate Act in 2021, we managed to do, I hope, some very constructive things. Uh, I wanna, but let's, let's talk a little bit about what the international stage offered in Glasgow. Uh, if Evie's with me, maybe we can share slide 10. Uh, this is a part of the written Glasgow Climate Pact that actually eventuated. And I just wanna point out in this particular case, uh, well, let's take paragraph 29. The font, the red fonts indicate that um, 
a series of NDCs are nationally determined contributions. These are the contributions to emissions reductions that each individual country pledged to make in 2015. Uh, and it was supposed to deliver on in 2020. Well, because of COVID, we had no uh, COP in 2020. The countries of the world in effect got an extra year and we gathered in November of 2021, about four months ago, to take a look at where the NDCs were. And we found that countries weren't committed to uh, the NDCs that the trajectory towards 2030 requires. There had been a lot of energy in 2015. Uh, there was still a lot of energy in 2021 in Glasgow, but not enough to uh, enable us to get to where we need to go. So paragraph 29 gives all the countries of the world uh, an additional year until the end of this year, November of 2022. So there's a, a setback. We go down to paragraph 36, and, and here there's a, a little progression that happened uh, and not in a good way. Uh, this is a, a statement. This is a call to action. Uh, all of the, the Climate Pact is. It's not a matter of execution and implementation. We're not even there yet internationally. This is just a statement of purpose, if you will. And we began in paragraph 36 calling promisingly for a phase out of coal power and fossil fuel subsidies. This was considered a path breaking. Uh, there hadn't been, coal had not been explicitly called out before 2021 in Glasgow. So in calling for the phase out of coal power and fossil fuel subsidies, uh, the parties involved, including John Kerry, were moving the ball down the field, but there was significant pushback. And the pushback came from uh, significantly from China and from Russia, which thought that 2030 and 2050 were too near term for them, but uh, it also came back, it came from allies of the US. Uh, so in any event, this phrase changed at the 11th hour, uh, and let's take a look at the next slide and see what happened. Two adjectives were added. Suddenly we weren't gonna phase out all coal power. This was on about the uh, 12th day of the 14 day Glasgow summit. It's a two week affair. We were only going to phase out unabated coal power, suggesting that abatement uh, would suffice to keep coal, coal going. And we weren't going to phase out any more inefficient or fossil fuel subsidies, but only the inefficient ones. And of course, all these topics or all these terms need to be defined before they're meaningful. But clearly, the addition of adjectives weakened the forward thrust of the original wording. And then at the 11th minute or the 59th minute of the 11th hour, the morning in which we all departed the city of Glasgow last November, an additional change was made to this language. And why don't we go to the next slide? Phase out in paragraph 36 became phase down. This change was insisted upon by an ally of the US, India. They uh, thought that phase out was too definitive. They weren't even satisfied with phasing out unabated coal power and inefficient fuel subsidies. Instead, they wanted to call for the phasing down of unabated coal power. This slide is actually uh, factually wrong. Uh, we, we preserved the phasing out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies uh, the Washington Post, from whom I took this wording, actually made a mistake. So we kept in the phasing out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies in Glasgow, but we included the new phrase, phase down of unabated coal power, done again for India. So uh, I look at something like this, which is the subject of international negotiation, and I knew that that, I had already figured out that that's not where a place like Massachusetts needs to be. We can't be quarreling about wording. We can't be quarreling about statements of intention. We need to get on to actually executing policy. I'm pleased to say that the Climate Act of 2021 was not about 
statements and it wasn't even about goal setting, you know, we'll do X by Y. It really was about implementation and execution, which is where international and national policy need to be too, to my way of thinking. Um, and just to segue to Massachusetts, Evie, let's move on a slide or two. Let's uh, keep going. Uh, that's obviously our statewide goal, but let's keep going beyond that to the three pies. Uh, here we have a situation where, and, and you, you'll explain, you'll understand why the Climate Act was written as it was, I think, if you meditate on these three pies. Global emissions by sector, we're talking across the world, show a, a significant amount of emissions emanating from agriculture and land use. A lot of methane, 24% uh, uh, across the face of the globe. And a lot of emissions as well are attributable to um, industry because of course you've got smokestacks belching fumes everywhere. Look at the change in the middle pie between the global emissions picture and the US emissions. And by the way, these data are the most recent data available to us. They're not recent enough, but they're unbelievably enough, the most recent we can get our hands on. When you get to the United States, agricultural use shrinks way down from 24% to nine. Industry use though stays about the same. Now segue to Massachusetts. Uh, Agricultural use is vanishingly small, 0.3 of 1%. And industry shrinks way down to a mere 10%. And that's because that's what a knowledge-based economy means. It means that we don't have a lot of smokestacks uh, emanating emissions, not to speak of really. What we have instead are plenty of emissions coming from three culprits. Um, electric power is the cleanest of the three. For a whole bunch of reasons, that's the one part of the elephant that state policy has been willing to grab onto. We, we've leaned hard enough with RPS standards and other initiatives on the utilities so that the generation of emissions from electricity is uh, down somewhat from what it was, let's say, 20 years ago. But in transportation, uh, this is essentially uh, a people getting in their single passenger car problem and driving to work or driving where in a knowledge-based economy like ours, unlike the world division of emissions and certainly unlike, and even unlike US and even unlike the world, transportation looms large. Buildings, uh, buildings are, you know, 6% of the action globally, about 12% of the action in the US, 27% of the action in Massachusetts because we don't have a crushing industrial sector, not that I want to minimize it. And we have an almost no emissions at all from agriculture. So you've got the big three buildings and you can subdivide them into commercial and residential, transportation and electricity. As a consequence, um, and remember, I wanted to write a, a bill with my colleagues, and this is always a collective, it's a team effort. I wanted to write a bill that um, didn't focus on statements of purpose after of the sort that I'd seen in, in COPS, but really focused on how the heck, not what we do, but how do we do it? How do we really get there? And so the climate bill is chock-a-block with uh, attempts to uh, make us... <laughs> stick to our knitting, eat our spinach, use whatever metaphor you want. Uh, we we uh, were the first state of the 50 states to say, you know what, this goal setting stuff, as important as it is for setting the general picture, uh, isn't, isn't motivating enough and we certainly shouldn't be doing it every 10 years. So let's, let's set goals for the state every five so that this is always on our radar screen. And then let's drill down even further. Let's not just set an overall emissions reduction goal every five years. Let's set it for six subsectors of the economy so that we get real. We're talking about transportation. Set a goal for 2025 and then for 2030 and 2035 for that sector specifically because it's the Massachusetts problem. It's our signature problem. And then go to residential buildings separately from commercial and industrial. 
set an emissions reduction goal for residential buildings. That's a big chunk of our problem. Set a third goal for commercial buildings. Set a fourth goal for electric power. A fifth goal for industry. And then just for good measure, because we're so concerned to reduce emissions from natural gas overall, uh, set a six overarching emissions reduction goal for natural gas systems and infrastructure. We want to get at this problem in as many different ways as we can. Uh, we, we went further even yet again, we wanted to figure out how we were going to get those emissions down in the subsector defined by buildings. So we, among other things, called for a new specialized opt-in stretch energy code. Sorry for that clunky wording. Uh, with a definition of net zero building and with a set of net zero building performance standards. As many of you know, tonight kicks off a very compact a run through five mandated hearings, all taking place within the next week, I might add, which is distressing to me. That's the way the administration set it up. Uh, and the hearings focus on the ad administration's implementation of our call for a net zero stretch energy code. I find that implementation just an, an aside wanting in some crucial respects and in respects that I know will be concerning to all of you. Uh, by the way, um, uh, tomorrow morning, I think, is the next hearing and it is for Metro West. So um, Evie, if I have that timing wrong, let me know. I think it's tomorrow, yes, it's Thursday morning rather uh, I think uh, at, is it nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, DOER is having its hearing to get public input on what I regard as their deficient stretch energy code. Uh, and I hope that as many people here tonight, it's tomorrow at 9 a.m. I hope that as many people here tonight can take part in that hearing. We've sent notices out to many of you with a, a link that would enable you to sign up. What do I find lacking? Uh, well, very specifically, and I'm not going to stay down in the weeds for too long tonight, but very specifically, uh, we had hoped that an individual town after a vigorous local consideration of the pluses and minuses could decide to go with all electric construction with ample uh, exceptions for labs and other special utility buildings. But the idea was for us to, to enable Vanguard communities that want to move out front on this problem to begin to say only with respect to new construction and gut rehabs, look, let's go all electric. And then once we clean up the grid, well, that's an important qualifier, but once we clean up the grid and take down that 18.5% of emissions attributable to electricity much further, uh, an all electric building is going to be truly uh, non-emitting. It will not be using natural gas or heating oil on the premises. And at the same time, it will be instead heating and cooling and cooking with an electric grid that's green. That's, that's the vision. I think the administration uh, is falling short in that vision. Um, I'll get off my soapbox here, but I, I felt constrained to, to mention that. Um, what do I think is lacking in the Climate Act? And then we wanna open this up quickly to some, oh, actually I wanna open it up to Q and A right now, but I will just say this, the Senate, in 2020, 2021 in the Climate Act wanted to green transportation. Obviously, as you look at the pie chart here, you can figure out why I was so concerned about it. In negotiations, uh, the House refused to do anything on the transportation sector. So we did not um, outlaw internal combustion engine cars by 2035, as California has done. A new Climate Act, and I hope you will see a new one this year, would do that. Uh, the Climate Act, because of uh, the House's insistence that we not do transportation, did not increase subsidies on the state level for purchasing internal combustion engine cars. I hope we can remedy that defect. And thirdly, you can't do individual passenger cars without taking note of low income communities. So as a matter of social justice, you need to green mass transportation at the same time that you green uh, the individually owned automobile. And so a third provision struck from the Senate version of the Climate Act at, House, at the House's insistence would have uh, greened buses in the T. I can talk about why we didn't go to other RTAs. I didn't want an unfunded local mandate that local re regional transportation authorities might struggle to deal with. But with respect to the T, I figured we could start to replace those diesel buses with green buses on a regular schedule. So just to uh, 
curtail this now because I want to go to Q&A. A new climate bill would deal with offshore wind, which is the priority of the House of Representatives this year, but would also get into the greening of transportation and do some significant additional things with respect to the greening of buildings too. Um, and with that, I want to um, go to Q&A. Both Chris and I, I think, are available to field questions and to hear your comments. Uh, isn't that right, Cindy? Yes, wonderful. And thank you both. I think, uh, please everyone join me in uh, giving our speakers a, a nice round of applause. And we can't uh, hear you, but. <laughs> but still, you can see it. Well, you can actually just see me, can't you? <laughs> you can't see everyone in the in the webinar. But um, I hope you feel our, uh, our appreciation for uh, your remarks so far. There, there have been a number of questions that have come in on on chat and also, um, you know, you know, on and off through other uh, through other communications. So, first off, um, one of the questions that that we want to flag is uh, related to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And um, if either of you have any perspective on um, that particular program, which does establish a price on carbon in the electric sector and um, any barriers that have come up for uh, lower income or urban communities compared sure. to. Uh, Chris, why don't you start off? You've I, a lot of I missed the that. policy. Say it one more time. The Regional Greenhouse Gas oh, Initiative and any yeah. challenges yeah. Yeah. around barriers for lower income yeah. or um, environmental justice communities in, in accessing the, the programs that, that 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 funding helps to support. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I talked about how cap and trade is is effectively a very close cousin to a, a, a carbon tax. And um, California has a very robust cap and trade program that um, has permit prices in, in and around $20 at times. Uh, Reggie's great. Um, it's uh, it's a good first start, I would say. Uh, my biggest issue with Reggie is that the permit prices are four or five dollars, and that's you know not that's enough to do some things, but not enough to really drive deep deep decarbonization. Uh, in in terms of access to making such a policy more progressive, uh, that's where you really do have to take care, especially in cap and trade programs. Um, you could auction off the permits and redistribute that, that money in, in the form of dividends, but they often go to other programs, whether they're solar subsidies or subsidies for other uh, low carbon technologies. And that's, you know, I've done some work on just how regressive solar subsidies can be. Um, and I want to flag actually that brings up another policy pressure point that we're going to get as we decarbonize the electricity sector. Um, so right now we we pay when you buy electricity, you pay for the electrons and you pay for the wires. And you pay for both of them on a per uh, kilowatt hour basis. Um, so uh, if I consume a lot of electricity, I obviously pay for the energy that I consume, the electron that electrons that I consume, but I also pay a lot toward the wires. Um, and traditionally, that's been an advantage of paying for the wires through this volumetric charge because high income households pay more for the wires than low income households. And we think that that's probably the right thing to do. Um, but what our recent work is pointing out is that solar changes that. So when wealthy people put solar panels on their roof, uh, they actually get out of paying for the wires, even though they're still using the wires. Um, so one of the pressure points that we're going to see among utilities going forward, and, and California is really facing this right now, and, and Germany uh, is as well, is that we're going to have to change how we pay for the wires. Um, so I, I know the question was about Reggie, but it launched me into my soapbox, which is, you know, being careful to make good intended concept or good intended policies not very super regressive and unfortunately right now i think the the ship is sailing or at least we we need to slow down or rethink some of the issues around electricity rates as we go to decarbonize through more and more electricity uh solar solar panels yeah 
Uh, thank you. I just want to add to that. Thanks, Chris. That, that's interesting, your, your point about distinguishing the wires um, and the electrons, um, because that has some implications for, for the offshore wind bill that we're just going to receive this week from the House, too. I, I just want to add to Cindy's question that, that um, I want to harken back to a very early point that Chris made. The most cost-effective way to protect poor people is to rebate all the money rather than to fund particular state bureaucracies that attempt to help people. The, the trouble with funding the state program, which is important, uh, but is less efficient, meaning some of the money uh, gets leached off to administrative costs, is that uh, it, it does rely on people applying. So immediately you're going to stop, uh, you're not gonna reach all the people you'd like to reach uh, some folks are feel inhibited about being on state assistance and asking for help. Uh, there's a huge kind of cultural inhibition to doing that. If you want to reach poor people and low income people across the board, rebate all the money because 60% of Massachusetts, actually the middle class, as well as the working class and the poor will get back more in rebate than they uh, will have paid in original fees. So a pure carbon tax system is better than funding state programs if you're concerned about reaching the most people with the most money. You also though need additional funds for people who are desperately poor. And, uh, and I am pleased to say that uh, while Biden's Build Back Better bill, which contains very important climate provisions is stuck in Washington, the infrastructure bill and the ARPA bill does fund LIHEAP. So we did get a huge infusion, not enough because the needs also ramping up uh, given inflation uh, and the steep rise in energy prices driven by uh, supply chain problems and more recently Ukraine. But we do need to supplement a pure carbon tax with appropriations out of the general tax base. As long as you've got a progressive income tax as the feds do more or less, uh, any money you fund from general governmental funds, any, any need you fund is going to be drawn from people of means primarily. And so you want to redistribute that to lie heap and to low income housing programs. But you have to resist the temptation to, to tax poor people in order to help poor people, which is what uh, certain versions of carbon taxation in Massachusetts, not my version, effectively does. It taxes them and turns around and tries to help them. That is inefficient. You lose a lot of money along the way and uh, uh, we should just be rebating the money instead. That's my two cents and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Appreciate your, your two cents there, uh, Senator Barrett. Um, having worked with some of the low-income communities who've looked at this issue, I think um, that, you know, there's a number of different opinions on, on this, but um, I do think that Another key issue that is popping up in the questions that I'm interested in both your thoughts on is this really core issue that buildings and energy efficiency plays in, in our broader uh, climate and clean energy plan. And one of the key issues that, that has really come up, particularly before the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council in administering the program is this problem of what's referred to as split incentives between renters and landlords. There's actually a hefty chunk of our state's population that are renters. And um, the, one of the questions that has come in that i um, love to hear your, your response to is how can we incentivize not just homeowners, single family homeowners, but also landlords to improve the energy efficiency of their properties? Um, so either of you, Professor Knittel or Senator Barrett, would you like to address uh, that? I'll offer a general thought, but although I'm very, Chris, do you have, a, do you have some, some feelings on that? I don't want to. No, why don't you start first, Mike? Okay. Uh, with regard to new construction, Cindy, uh, we, the stretch code actually does a decent, the stretch code that I'm unhappy with, uh, proffered by the administration. Remember, I hope you all testify tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Metro, Metro West and Greater Boston hearing on the administration's proposal. But with respect to new construction in mul of multiple unit dwellings, uh, the stretch code does a decent job of uh, essentially, um, well, requiring, requiring uh, builders of multiple unit dwellings 
to, to do the right thing, not only, well, first of all, by the building envelope, right? You wanna make sure the slab, the walls and the ceiling hold energy very, very uh, efficiently. You wanna make sure the doors and windows are energy tight. Uh, the, the stretch code does a good job there. So the landlord will pay, or I should say the original buyer of the building, whether it's a government or a private sector that's going to rent an affordable unit, private sector entrepreneur or corporation, they're going to pay for those improvements. But we found out that the initial cost isn't great. Actually, in a multiple unit situation, the initial cost of doing things right from scratch is uh, the economics are better than for the single family home. They're not too bad for the single family home either. But the more units you add, the more energy efficiency you can make. And this also includes that the air quality that the tenant then experiences is much better, right? You've built a very good building. It not only holds the warmth so that the family can stay warm, it also actually has very efficiency air filtration, very efficient air filtration, which is critically important for the health of the tenants. The more difficult issue is retrofitting. And I know you're concerned as we all are with the people who are currently tenants living in the thousands or tens of thousands of units in Massachusetts. The retrofit piece for multiple unit dwellings is a tough nut to crunch because the walls are built, the slabs are constructed, the roofs are there. Uh, you can replace the doors and the window and that will help a lot. And you, But you may be limited in the insulation you can pump into pre-existing walls. So that is a more difficult problem. And, and uh, I suspect that in the end, we're going to have to help small landlords a lot. The owner of the two-family house or the triple-decker, uh, probably any units under six, we can afford to give heavy subsidies to. Uh, once you get into larger buildings, though, um, we're going to use, we're going to have to use mandates. We're going to have to be sensitive over time, but we're going to have to essentially require that there be significant improvements. Let me mention one thing that the Senate would like to do in the new climate bill. I mentioned that we wanted to green transportation. Here's one thing we, we want to do. I hope I can sell my colleagues in the Senate on this idea. And that is a, an idea that was a priority of the Environmental League of Massachusetts, ELM, four years ago. Every house at the time of sale gets, has to, would have to have an energy audit and would be given an energy grade. The idea is to use good economics to add value to the house when it's put up for sale I'll be able for the first time to advertise that my particular dwelling, I put some money into it maybe over the years, it's, it's gonna have low monthly operating costs for the next buyer. And here's the scorecard, not just an audit, but here's a scorecard distilling the results of the audit into easily understood metrics that demonstrates that this is a good buy on a monthly operating basis for, for my potential uh, set of buyers. If we can uh, overcome the significant resistance on the part of the real estate lobby that killed this idea in 2018, and if we can start to award grades on the basis of energy efficiency for existing homes, uh, including, I might add, multiple unit dwellings, we're going to start to reward people for doing the right thing. Chris? I'm, well, uh, that's a perfectly... <laughs> Uh, entry into what I was going to say, and, and that is, um, we so we do think that in the presence of the right information, the value of the home changes and the value of the rent would change too, in, in even, even with split incentives, right? So you could imagine doing the same grading or requiring the same grading for all rental properties, so that now when a rentee comes and, look, and shops around for rental properties, they have better uh, understanding of the energy costs associated with each each unit. Um, we and I'll say that I'll admit this is a hole in the economics literature. We 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 don't know whether or not that's enough to overcome the split incentive problems. Um, but we do think that that's a step forward. And it, so that leaves open the door for targeted subsidy programs that might be targeted for uh, rental properties uh, for energy efficiency. Um, if we think that that split incentive problem drives a bigger wedge than, than in um, uh, owner-occupied housing. Uh, but the provision of information, and we're seeing that in commercial markets on their own, right? That they're providing that information 
often by themselves, but regulations around inf information provision can have big effects in these types of markets. Thank you. Professor, um, I think this question is, uh, is perfect for you. Could you talk about how the war in the Ukraine may affect energy prices here or globally? Yeah, um, so I, I'm actually teaching my energy economics and policy class right now. So I, uh, I on the fly, had a, a lecture on this on, on Tuesday. Um, how it'll affect energy prices here, I think the most direct impact is gonna be through oil prices. And we're starting to see that already. Uh, Russia's have, starting to have a bit of a hard time selling their oil. Um, I think that'll be short-term in nature. There's gonna be enough uh, demand out there that willing to buy Russian oil. And the oil market is a world market because it's so easy, easy to move oil around that it probably won't have a lasting impact on oil prices, but certainly over the next few months, uh, we'll see a bump up in oil prices, which will impact fuel prices. Um, we'll see a little bit of upward pressure on natural gas prices uh, because we're trying to send as much natural gas over to Europe as we can to replace that Russian, Russian natural gas. Uh, we have um, about 122 uh, billion cubic meters per year capacity of LNG, and we're, we're currently exporting about 100 uh, of that. So there's still a little bit more headroom that we could export more. And of course, as we export more, that means there's less to sell here. Um, so, but, but that'll be fairly mild um, in terms of natural gas prices. Um, so the big impact will be at, at the pump. Uh, but we might see upward pressure on natural gas prices. And, and I would just add to that, uh, be interested uh, in your assessment of this, Chris. Uh, uh, my worry is that as gasoline prices go up, and they were going up before the Ukraine, of course, because of supply side uh, issues, I mean, uh, supply chain issues, and now they're going up even more. This is what makes a, a carbon tax even less politically palatable, meaning I can't get votes. <laughs> right. I no, just look, can't get votes. We'll uh, see rescind, rescinding state gasoline. I mean, there, there are liberal Democrats in the US Congress, at least I can say that the Massachusetts House and Senate are not, are not by any means in this camp. There are liberal Democrats, Democrats in the US Congress calling for a, um, a, uh, a hold. A on a federal gasoline tax right. uh, in order to give consumers relief during a time when prices are going up. People are, especially people with, of limited means, are price sensitive. They really do hurt. We all know anecdotally of folks who need to go a long way to a construction job and are now hard pressed to get there, or maybe not even a construction job, maybe they're a home health aide and they're getting minimum wage or, or less. When people start hurting, the idea that you would tax them, even for a good cause, becomes anathema to, uh, to many, many of my colleagues. And the whole issue of the rational option, a uh, revenue positive carbon tax or a revenue neutral one goes out the window. That's as a practical matter where we are. And uh, that's, um, well, we just have to take that into account as we negotiate climate policy. Our options are constrained. Thank you. Thank you both. I think we have time for uh, possibly one more, maybe two uh, questions um, before we head into a, a wrap up. Um, one question that seems to be popping here is uh, you have mentioned that the House is taking up the offshore wind bill. Um, Senator Barrett, what do you think of uh, offshore wind debates? in the Senate and um, how uh, does this move forward um, towards a, a policy at the end of session? Well, this is a gnarly topic. Uh, I think there are significant problems, not with offshore wind, we need it as clean energy, but when you actually structure or attempt to structure a market as the house has done, all kinds of gnarly things come up. Uh, and I'll mention just two or three. Uh, we have a shortage of workers for every clean energy sector. You can find documented shortages of uh, people willing to drive MBTA buses. That would be clean transportation. 
Uh, there are so many shortages at the MBTA repair yard in Everett, Massachusetts. Well, they're, they're down 100 folks, which means that when something breaks, it doesn't get back into service as quickly as it needs to. Then you've got documented shortages, shortages of energy efficiency workers, by which I mean the folks who would go into your basement uh, and evaluate an HVAC system. All of us have experience trying to get service people into our houses over the last three months. It's not just a COVID thing. It's also a longer term worker shortage thing. Uh, the same is true for solar. Uh, the number of solar jobs about 9,500 in 2020 is way down from 15,000 in 2015. So we've actually lost a significant number of workers on roofs putting in our panels. And then you get to offshore wind. Uh, the house is so, uh, enamored of, how, of offshore wind, that it would permanently put solar at a disadvantage, permanently put energy dis, uh, efficiency, meaning HVAC work at, at a disadvantage, and make it very hard to hire those T drivers that I referenced. Uh, they really would like to see the shortage in workers potentially to assemble offshore windmills uh, they'd like to see that vacuum filled before the other three and they restructure the worker training programs in Massachusetts to make sure that offshore wind jobs are the first ones filled. The Senate would like a strategic plan. We want to know how to make sure that all these clean energy sectors can continue to move forward. We need them all to realize our climate goals. So the first thing we want is a strategy. Listen, uh, Massachusetts which is stable, slightly gaining in population needs a pro-immigration strategy. We need to be welcoming to every climate refugee that we can <laughs> entice to Massachusetts because, and, because we are short uh, young people who can help us in all kinds of service jobs. We need to pay them decently because we're a high cost of living state, but we need them comfortable living here. So we have to be pro-immigrant. We have to have recruitment programs, quite frankly, uh, directed at West Virginia and other places in which we try to attract uh, folks within the United States already to want to live here. We need to figure out how to make sure they can afford to live here because we have a worker shortage problem that's, so far as I can tell, uh, secular. It's structural. It will extend long after COVID, I hope, has subsided, which is all by way of saying that an offshore wind strategy cannot overweight offshore wind to the detriment of solar energy efficiency and clean transit. We've got to somehow make it all work. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that the tax giveaways, the tax loopholes in the House bill dwarf the tax incentives that we're, we gave to the Massachusetts life sciences sector when we chose to build that 10 years ago. $50 million a year. Uh, we only let the Mass Life Sciences Center dole out $30 million a year in tax breaks. And, uh, and you know how these tax breaks work, by the way. It's not that an offshore wind company uh, incurs a lot of state taxes necessarily. These are refundable and, and exchangeable tax credits. If I soak up, if I don't owe Massachusetts a penny, but I get a tax break because I'm involved in the offshore wind business, I can then sell that to a wealthy individual so that she can avoid her tax liability to the state of Massachusetts. That's what, a ref that's what the film tax credit controversy is all about. It's not that people who make movies here incur a lot of state taxes, it's that they get to sell the tax break on the open market to rich people who do live here. The subsidies given to offshore wind companies are greater than similar subsidies accorded to life sciences companies, much greater than similar subsidies accorded to, to uh, people who make movies in Massachusetts. Where's the cost benefit analysis? Where's the balancing out between solar energy efficiency, mass transit and offshore wind? Where's the strategy to recruit people into the state? Um, it's all lacking in the house bill and I regret that. I'm, we're gonna try to do offshore wind in the Senate, Lord knows, but we need to address these serious questions of uh, institutional balance and tax balance. Thank you. Okay, final question. I know we're, uh, in, I, I think there, there are dozens here that have come in that we haven't been able to address, but let's wrap up with something big picture for both of you. 
what um, currently is keeping you up at night and what is currently giving you hope? Chris, you go first. <laughs> A tough uh, question. Well, I, I think uh, obviously tonight's discussion has been about climate change, but um, there's a war going on and that's, you know, an immediate threat to many, many of our allies and friends over in Ukraine. Um, I've got colleagues from the region and, and students as well. So that's certainly keeping me up, up at night. Um, what's giving me hope? Um, I, I guess I'll, do, I'll give, I'll try to give two hopes. Uh, one is I'm, you know, I'm lucky enough to be at MIT where I see brilliant new technologies on the horizon. Um, and there's many, um, whether it's, you know, new, new solar technologies, new battery technologies, or um, new nuclear technologies, the smaller scale nuclear reactors that can be deployed in a much safer way. Um, that certainly gives, gives me hope. Um, the second is, you know, I, I followed quite closely the, the reconciliation negotiations that were going on at the end of last year. And um, I had a bit of an inside track into what was going on because I showed you one of my maps, um, but I would get requests from staffers in DC to change the maps in a little bit. You know, for example, one night I got a request to show the map without gasoline consumption uh, as part of the carbon footprint. And in the next day in the newspapers, there was discussion about a climate uh, carbon tax without that would exempt gasoline. Um, so they were having deep conversations about really important climate bills. And I'm not just prices on carbon, but um, alternatives as well that would certainly move us in, in a good way toward our, our carbon goals. Um, and let's be honest, we haven't had those conversations uh, for at least four years. Um, so that gives me hope. Um, I, and I'll give a third one, which is you're starting to see the tide change, I believe, among uh, Republicans, especially young Republicans in how they view climate change. And my own personal view, and I'm not a political scientist, I'm an economist, but I don't see sustainable climate policy unless we get the Republicans on board in DC, not talking about Massachusetts, because otherwise what we'll have is every four years, we'll jump back and forth between doing something on climate and not doing something on climate. So I'm uh, that gives me hope that I'm starting to see young Republicans and Republicans on co in, sadly uh, in coastal states uh, starting to care more about climate change. Thank you, Professor. Senator well, Barrett. Must, well, I must say, uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, listening to Chris gives me hope. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an encouraging analysis, and he's very nice to have joined us tonight. Again, I want to thank Cindy and Jeff and Stephanie and uh, Metro West Climate Solutions for having us. Um, I'm, I'm a long-term optimist, and, it's you know... The question. The United States is normal... And oh, that's Siri. <laughs> I just woke up Siri. Oh, my goodness. Excuse me. Siri, please be quiet. Um, I'm a, when I exercise in the evening, I have taken to watching a, a, a documentary made of the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine in 2013, 2014. It's now uh, trending, as you might imagine, on Netflix. Those uh, folks are amazing. And watching the individual heroism that uh, the person in the street and in the town and in the city are demonstrating in the Ukraine, fighting at a gut level for democracy uh, is hope inspiring. And there's an analogy here with climate uh, where the circumstances in the short term aren't anywhere near as dire, but I am seeing a continuing transformation in uh, the energy that people are bringing to this issue. Um, every morning, as Chris knows, I, I walk my dog uh, early. I walk by his house uh, and his wonderful dog and his great family. And I go into the woods and I meet with neighbors who uh, converge in these, this little bit of park land uh, beyond a little league field. And I can see the 
movement toward a determination to do something on climate on the part of almost everyone. And it doesn't matter if you're urban or suburban or rural. It doesn't matter if you're conventionally progressive. To Chris's point, we all are starting to get it. And there's an incredible surge of commitment. And uh, I want to touch on something else Chris said, that, that surge of commitment extends to uh, innovators. So I too am a technology optimist. Uh, and I believe in the potential for climate tech to do a great deal of good. So you take the uh, energy evidence in Ukraine and you import it um, uh, with the blessings of, of, of distance uh, to the energy you feel in the climate movement in Massachusetts. You extend it right into the ranks of young people and into the ranks of universities and uh, high schools and colleges. And you see that people are determined to do something about this climate business. They're all going to turn out tomorrow at nine o'clock to testify, by the way, at this DOER hearing. That's the amazing thing. Just kidding about that. Um, but in any event, um, there's a lot of uh, reason to think that people are going to figure out a way to turn this around. And with the help of innovation, I think we can do it. It's gonna to be tough, but I think we can do it. Terrific. Well, I think Jeff, Thank you very much. Let's. Uh, we have lost very few people during this whole program because you you all have been so gripping and engaging, and substantive in your remarks. So thank you, Cindy Lupi, as our moderator, Senator Barrett, Professor Knittel. We appreciate your time this evening. Uh, we will be uh, back uh, in um, uh, uh, on March fifteenth in thirteen days, Wednesday the fifteenth, uh, to do this again. Uh, with uh, Representative Jeff Roy and Representative Alice Peisch uh, holding forth from the House side. So we're going to hear a little bit about that, that gnarly House offshore wind bill and uh, be able to explore uh, these, these issues and questions in, in some detail again. So thank you all for coming tonight uh, until March 15th. Have a good thank evening. Thank you. Good night, everyone.